Ni hao to y'all. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Gong Fu Tea Cha. We're here at beautiful Guanyin Tea House in Austin, Texas. And today, we're going to continue our discussion on the types of tea with my favorite kind of tea, which is puar. Specifically, sheng puar is my favorite type. If I were trapped on a desert island with only one kind of tea, God forbid it ever happened that way, but it would be sheng puar. So this tea is very near and dear to my heart. Let's talk about what is puar. Uh, puar is a little tricky to define. It's very easy to define some of the other categories of tea. Green tea is unoxidized. Red tea, hong cha, or black tea, some people call it black tea, is fully oxidized, very simple. Oolong's kind of partially oxidized. That's, that's, uh, that's a little, you know, it's also kind of easy. Puar is very complex because what puar is and why puar tea is considered puar tea is less about its oxidation level or even the way that it's processed and more about its historical role in the Chinese tea trade, specifically the trade between China and its neighbors in Central Asia where they would trade tea for horses on the old tea horse road. So what is puar? The first thing that you should know about puar is that it's from Yunnan. Yunnan is the southwesternmost province of China. It has the most ethnic diversity of any province of China. It is on the frontiers, on the borders of what is China and what is not. To its north is Tibet. And then uh, uh, it also borders Southeast Asia uh, to its south, uh, Laos and Burma and stuff like that. And so it is neighboring a lot of other nations, other people, other cultures. Uh, Yunnan is also the home of the tea plant, one of the ancestral homes of the wild tea plant in China. Um, in addition to like Sichuan and Guangxi and Guizhou and some of these other places in the southwest of China, tea grows wild there naturally. And the tea that they grow there now that is used to make puar is very closely related to the ancestral variety. Uh, and we refer to Yunnan tea oftentimes as Daiyajong, big leaf tea plant. That is the breed of tea. And that it does have larger leaves. Not all of its leaves are large. The little baby leaves coming out are still little. But it is a much larger leafed tea plant than what we think of the little bushes that we think of like a whole field of tea and these nice little rows of bushes. That's not what puar looks like. Puar is tall trees. They grow tall, especially when they're old. You have hundreds, even more than a thousand year old tea plants in Yunnan and they get tall. You actually have to climb up in them to pick the tea. They look like a little tree and that's a fun part of picking puar tea that you don't have to do with other types of tea is that you actually get to climb up in the tree. It is very entertaining and pick the tea yourself. And so that is another thing. So you've got, it's gotta be from Yunnan and it has to be from these varieties of tea plants. And that there's also this Xiaozhong Yezhong, the small medium leaf variety tea plant gets used for tea, especially if you're east of the Lanzhang River, which is what becomes the Mekong when it hits Southeast Asia, is the Lanzhang River. And that flows right down the middle of Yunnan and then enters uh, Burma and Lao. And uh, that is the dividing line between where in the west of Yunnan you see a lot of the Daiyajong being used, though not exclusively, and then east of the Lanzang you start to see the Xiaozhong Yejong, the small medium leaf variety of the tea plant being used. So that's kind of basically what Puar is. It's from Yunnan, it's from these varieties of tea plants. Puar is aged, not always. There is fresh Puar. We're about to make some. But puar is one of the categories of tea that is traditionally aged. It is intended to be aged. And the culture of aging tea comes from its role in the tea trade. So you have the ancient tea horse road, which is a trade route whereby tea from China was traded to Central Asia. Because in Central Asia, like Tibet, for example, uh, where it's very high and dry, they don't really grow plants per se. Uh, they grow like grass and then animals eat the grass. I'm just gonna get everything heated up for us, starting off. And then animals eat the grass, and then they eat the animals and the milk from the animals. And it's not a very balanced diet. You get weird nutrient deficiency diseases because you're not getting any plants. And so for those people, tea is not a luxury, but an absolute necessity. It provides valuable phytonutrients, prevents them from getting all kinds of gnarly uh, disorders. And so as a result, the tea would travel it would be collected in a city called Puar, which is why Puar tea is called Puar. The tea is not necessarily grown there, but it is consolidated there before it gets shipped out to its destination. And so it gets 
produced where it gets produced and then it gets consolidated in Puar City, which is a little city in Yunnan. It was called Simao for the past couple hundred years and they changed the name back to Puar to capitalize on the popularity of Puar tea. And from Puar, uh, the tea would get processed and pressed into beings. Because this tea was a trade commodity, it has to be standardized. And so it would get standardized and it also helps to consolidate it and press it so that it doesn't get broken. You're not traveling with huge sacks of light, loose leaves that are very bulky. Instead, you have this nice stone-pressed being of tea. Being just means cookie or cake. Uh, as you can see, it is a big, giant cookie of tea. And so these are 357 grams. They've been standardized to 357 grams. Presumably, that was a nice round number in ancient Chinese measures. Yeah, there you go, being time. And then seven beings together is called a tong. This object that holds seven beings is also called a tong. So a tong of tea is seven beings, and then 40 tongs is a jian, and one jian would have been traded for a horse on the Cha Ma Gu Dao, the ancient tea horse road. And so it'd be sitting in a courtyard in a, in a warehouse in Puar City for who knows how long, maybe years, before it gets shipped out, and then it's traveling up and down these curvy mountain roads on the back of a horse or a donkey or what have you, and it's getting rained on, it's getting dewed on, uh, it's getting wet and then drying out again and again. And it's also just aging, it's getting old. And as it ages and gets old, it starts to be colonized and broken down by microbes, specifically Aspergillus, which is a mold that breaks it down. And uh, that microbial fermentation process is what gives Puar its aged taste, which is an earthy, woody, dark color uh, and flavor that it achieves. And so the people on the receiving end of this tea trade started drinking this aged tea that would have reached them in its fermented state. And they think, oh, it's supposed to taste like this. They developed a culture of drinking aged tea. And the same goes for southern China, like Guangdong and Guangxi, where it's very moist and humid. Puar tea also uh, is consumed in its aged fermented state in those places, especially for dim sum in Guangdong province, Canton. They love to eat dim sum, and they always love to drink puar tea, dark, earthy, aged puar tea with that process. And so the, uh, the culture of aged tea uh, sort of revolves around um, taking these cakes or bricks or whatever shape the tea is in and putting it away and letting it get old and then drinking it in its aged state. And there's a tradition also in these places where they do like this pressed aged tea of pressing it into, say, a grapefruit, taking a whole yodze uh, pomelo skin and turning it uh, into a big cake of tea by pressing the tea leaves into it stuffing it full of leaves and sewing it shut. You also will have gourds being filled with tea and ceramic urns being filled with tea. There is a tradition of a dowry tea, which is when your daughter is born, you take a bunch of nice tea, you bury it under the courtyard and leave it there for the next 20 years. And then when she's ready to get married, you dig it up and then you have this nice batch of aged tea that is very valuable and that's your daughter's dowry. And so Puar, we're talking about sheng and shu puar. Today we're talking about sheng puar. Sheng means raw. It also means alive. There's a couple of different ways to interpret that word sheng. But what it really means is that sheng puar is tea that is produced more or less like green tea and is not intentionally fermented before it is sold. Uh, that's shu puar, and that was developed in the early 70s, and we'll talk about that in a whole other episode. But sheng puar is produced very similar to green tea, almost exactly like green tea and it has been produced that way for thousands of years. And so the difference between sheng and green tea, sheng puar and green tea is, um, you know, it's kind of subtle and nuanced. You can consider sheng puar a subcategory of green tea. That said, no one will ever refer to sheng puar as green tea. Uh, it is not the, the nomenclature that we tend to use. So what is the difference and how is sheng produced? The way they start off is exactly the same. So you pick the tea early in the morning when there's still dew on the leaves. You go and you take it to the processing facility and you sha ching it, which means you kill the green, heat it in a wok, basically roasting it in a wok with no oil at high heat to uh, denature that enzyme polyphenol oxidase, just the same as green tea. One big difference here is that green tea is gonna be cooked at about twice the temperature of sheng puar. Sheng puar uses a lower temperature than most green tea. Every tea master does it differently, but the tradition in Yunnan making sheng puar is to use a lower temperature for firing your, your tea. Um, and then once the tea has been fired to mostly, most complete dryness, almost complete dryness, then it is finished by drying it in the sun. You take it, you sprinkle it out 
uh, in a very thin layer on a bamboo mat and you dry it in the sun. And that's the other big difference between Sheng Pur and green tea, is that green tea can be dried with hot air, for example, from charcoal, whereas uh, Sheng Pur is always sun dried, and that's part of its deal. And it can also go through an additional process called Rou Nian, and I've seen this, the Aka people on Nanwa Mountain will do this. They'll fire it once, halfway, Sha Ching it halfway, take it out of the wok, put it on a tray, knead it, kind of twist and knead it, almost like dough, and, um, and do a little bit of this thing, and a little this thing, and kind of squish it up a little bit, squeeze some of those juices out, and then it goes back into the wok, gets fired a second time, those juices that have been squeezed out get cooked onto the tea, cooked into the tea itself, and, and they do that for the tea that they're gonna consume themselves, and also we get some of that here because we like it. That's their kind of colloquial style of doing that, and they'll, they'll process it that way. For tea that's being sold to the market, they'll fire it once, no massaging. Um, but for tea they make themselves, they'll fire it twice with a massaging process in between, and they say it gives it a better flavor. It doesn't look as good, but it gives it a better flavor. In any case, when we're done with the process, whether the tea gets massaged or not, what we end up with is called Mao Cha, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like right here. Mao Cha means hairy tea, and it refers to both the, the hairiness of the leaves themselves, as we know, uh, tea leaves themselves are fuzzy and hairy, but also because of the kind of sticky, hairy, sticking out all over the place situation that we have with these unpressed leaves. So Mao Cha is freshly processed Sheng Pur. It has not been pressed, it has not been fermented, it has not been aged. That's what you call Mao Cha. And we're gonna drink some right now. This particular Mao Cha is called uh, Duo Yi Zai, which is the name of the village near the patch where the tea is grown. And this is, there are some qualifiers for this tea. It's not just a Sheng Pu'er, specifically it's Gu Shu Cha, which means ancient tree tea. Ancient tree tea uh, it comes from trees older than a couple hundred years old. Some say 400 years old is the cutoff point for ancient tree tea. Uh, at any rate, the oldest teas on Nanwa Mountain are 800 years old, and so this tea is from trees in that neighborhood between four and 800 years old. And those, these trees, they grow tall. Their leaves do tend to be big, but they don't have to be big. There are people who are like, well, if it's Gu Shu Cha, then the leaves must be huge. Well, not necessarily. Even an ancient tree will produce small leaves, especially near the base, when you have little branches coming up near the base. Uh, why Gu Shu Cha? Why ancient tree tea? Well, tea trees, like vampires, become more powerful the older they get. And so the chi, both the, the mouthfeel, the, the, the kogan, and then the aftertaste, the huigan, the huyun, all of these characteristics of good tea that we've talked about in other episodes are going to be superior in a gushu cha. Uh, and the main thing is gonna be, mm, very nice, very nice. The way it makes you feel. Sheng Pu'er should brew up golden green like this, not orange. A lot of very low quality Sheng Pu'er that is imported into this country uh, brews orange in color and it is very bitter. I know people who are like, oh no, I never drink Sheng Pu'er. My tea master says that Sheng Pu'er is not fit for human consumption. That's not true. Sheng Pu'er is great. It's really good for you. People in Yunnan, the tea farmers, drink Sheng Pu'er all day long and they live to be like 120 and they're dancing on New Year's Day. So. Sheng Pu'er is definitely not bad for your digestion. It's definitely not bad for you. Everyone's body is different. If your body doesn't like it, that's fine. However, you might be drinking really bad Sheng Pu'er, especially if it brews orange, if the leaves look all chopped up. We have nice whole leaves in here. That's good Sheng Pu'er. If the leaves look all chopped up and if it comes from a big factory, then there's a good chance that your Sheng Pu'er is just not very good. Um, so you want your Sheng Pu'er to brew a beautiful golden green color and it should be sweet, and it should have a very fragrant character, and it does have a bitterness to it. There is a natural bitterness to Sheng Pu'er, but it should not be overwhelming or, uh, or unpalatable. It should taste good. Sheng Pu'er is supposed to be good. So, note that. Um, the process for steeping Sheng Pu'er, oh, and Gu Shu Cha, again, to, just to specify, Gu Shu Cha, ancient tree tea, uh, that concept didn't emerge until fairly recently in the Pu'er market, maybe in the past 20 years. Tea farmers have always been aware that the better, the older the tree, the better the tea. However, the Pu'er market was not such that people were harvesting tea from just particular trees. It used to be a whole huge region, like the entire Menghai mountain range, 
all of the tea from there would be consolidated into one factory, processed together, pressed together, uh, and that's what you get. And so you're getting a whole huge swath of different things. And it's only in the past 20 years or so with the emergence of single farm puar that we're starting to see, A, we're starting to see tea from single mountains, and we're also starting to see tea from just ancient trees because it is considered a superior puar. And again, this is duo yi zai, which means that it's from one single patch. It's just from the duo yi patch on the very tip top of Nanua Mountain at about 1950 meters. And as we, the, as the tea, the puar market becomes more and more niche and specialized, you are seeing from a whole region and a factory representing that region to a single mountain, to a single farm on the mountain, to a single patch on the mountain. We have tea from the Duoyi patch and the Shito patch and the Banpo patch and the Yako patch. They're all on the same mountain, all the same farmer. They all taste different because the diwei, the flavor of the earth, what some might call the terroir of each patch is a little bit different. And this is the highest patch and makes the sweetest tea. And so those are two qualifiers for this tea. It is Gushu Cha and it is single patch tea. And so I'm just gonna demonstrate the Sheng Puar pouring technique. A, I like to use a little cooler water because Sheng Puar does have that bitter edge to it and has the capacity to get bitter. So I will let my water cool a little, little bit for Sheng Puar. This water is actually already cooled because I've been sitting here talking about it for the past five minutes or whatever. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go ahead and go straight and well, I'll go ahead and pour it in here so that it looks like I'm cooling my water because y'all are familiar with that process. And the, the process is gonna be the same as when we did our green tea episode and talking about the, the process of cooling water for green tea, we're gonna smell our leaves. We're gonna feel it out. It smells really good. Wish y'all could smell it. Technology has only come so far, but yeah. This is gonna be the first tea I've drunk all day. I've been getting ready all day long, so I'm like really excited to actually drink some tea. Um, so my water feels about ready. It's probably about 205, maybe even a little higher. I don't go as cool as I do with green tea on, as I do on Sheng Puer. Um, Sheng Puer, especially fresh Sheng Puer, use a little bit cooler water, but not as cool as green. And then when I'm pouring, I'm going to define a handle and a spout for my gaiwan. And you can do this in a teapot, of course. Teapots are great for sheng puar. I'm using a gaiwan. This is my dai clay gaiwan from Shishuang Bana. It is just for this kind of tea. And I'm gonna, so where is my handle and where is my spout? My handle, well, my spout is where the tea gets poured out. Even, you know, nursery rhyme school children know that. And then the handle is the opposite of the spout. And so when I pour sheng puer, um, and this is my friend uh, uh, Xiao Yan taught me this in, uh, he's from Hunan, but I met him in Yunnan. And so him and his whole clique are all about sheng puer. It's all they drink. If you try to serve him other tea, they'll laugh at you. So they're very, very serious about the sheng puer. And he taught me this very effective pouring technique for sheng puer, which is where, like we've talked about in our Phoenix Oolong episode, uh, the, this tea has a cha dan, a tea gall the gallbladder of the chi tea, and the cha dan is an imaginary spot in the center of the cha di, the mass of leaves. So this mass of leaves is called the cha di, and then the center of that, right in the middle, is the cha dan, and that means the gallbladder of the tea. Obviously, tea doesn't have a gallbladder, but the analogy is that when you are butchering an animal, you want to avoid rupturing the gallbladder because it will um, burst and spill bile on the meat and make the meat bitter. Likewise, if you rupture the cha dan by pouring water directly onto the center of the leaf mass, it will make the tea bitter. So we avoid the cha dan. And when we're pouring sheng pour, we avoid the cha dan by pouring down the handle. So here on the right side, stage right of my gaiwan is the handle. And that is where the opposite of where the tea gets poured out is. And I will pour it into that spot for every single steeping of tea, and it doesn't need very, very long. It's actually pretty fast, especially these first couple steepings because it's loose. Water probably got a little cool there because I did end up talking more than I anticipated, but this is, gives you kind of an idea of what it's gonna look like. Beautiful, clear, green gold wicker. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see all the little hairs floating in it. There we go. And I'm gonna go ahead and do one more steeping for y'all so that you can see. Don't worry, I'm gonna drink that. It's gonna get drunk. So you can see what this wicker looks like after it's been um, steeped a couple times. And also I like to leave my lid 
skewed or off in between steepings, kind of like for green tea. Maybe not completely off like I do for green tea, but I'll leave, leave my lid offset a little bit like that. So notice I didn't turn my guy on and I didn't do my little like pouring off the back trick because these big leaves, the, the leaves don't really retain that much water. So I didn't have to do that little extra squeezy pour. You can do it. Just remember which side is your handle and which side your spout. Don't break the gall. That's really most of what there is to shung pour. And you can cool your water, not too, too much, a little bit. And I'm gonna go straight from my kettle this time. In, down the handle, I am not breaking the cha dan. I'm not breaking the tea gall. I'm not even moving the leaves very much. Just a nice, gentle, and then I go a little, little nudge at the end there on the top. All righty. Go ahead and get that last little drops out. Very few, like I said, these big leaves don't hold as much water as the little smushed up green tea leaves will. Um, and there we go, beautiful color of the liquor. This is fresh Shung Pua. This is from 2017, last year, uh, and it has not been aged, and so it's gonna produce beautiful green liquor. It will be fragrant and sweet, uh, similar to green tea. All right, cool. Well, we're gonna go ahead and move on and make a tea that's a little bit older to kind of give you an idea of how this tea ages as it ferments, as it sits there and ferments naturally. And the tea we're gonna do today, I think we're gonna do the Tassa Bang. Yes. Tassa is a 2008 Shengpur. It is not Gushu Cha. It is from all different ages of tea plant. It is not a single patch. It's a more classic style. It is a single farm and it is a single mountain. So it does have that going for it. Tassa. Tassa Bing. Here's what it looks like or looked like. There's the wrapper, the label's upside down. I don't know whose fault that is, maybe mine. But at any rate, this is what the wrapper looked like. Uh, it's a very generic wrapper because we had them press this Bing for Tassa when the Bing was requested. They didn't have a Bing of tea from 2008, but they did have a batch of very nice loose Sheng Pua from 2008. So we had them press a run of them. We saw them now, we drank them. I love it. This is what the cake looks like. A little Nefei folded in half there. Um, so the Tassa Bing is what is sometimes referred to in the uh, tea industry as being a golden puar. It's 10 years old. And again, this was purchased for Tassa for his 10th birthday. And the idea is that if you ha are lucky enough to find a cake from when you're born, or if you happen to be pretty young uh, and can find a cake of tea from the year you were born, take that cake, put it away, drink it only on your birthday, and you'll be able to drink that tea for the next maybe 70 years. And by the time you're 70 years old, you'll be drinking some really, really, really fancy birthday tea. So, Tassa, if you're watching, do that. Hopefully I'll join you on your 70th birthday and we can drink some really old Tassa Bing together. But at any rate, this type of tea is referred to as golden puar sometimes in the American tea industry. I have not necessarily heard that, uh, it called that in China. But in the American tea industry, people refer to mid-age sheng as golden puar, and that is because it produces liquor with a golden color. And the predominant flavor profile, and here's our pre-broken up tasa that's gonna go in the gaiwan, boom, just like that. I'm just gonna give this guy a little, crush it up a little bit break it up a little more. We don't have a ton of time today, so I want, to, want this tea to look like it's supposed to look, um, you know, early on. Uh, Golden Pour is gonna have a profile, it's gonna be very woody. A lot of the very floral fragrances of uh, fresh Shang Pour of Mao Cha will have been subdued and become more of a hay, straw, aged wood, and a little bit of like a dried fruit note is what we're looking for on this type of pour. And this type of pour is a little less astringent. As it gets older, the pour loses some of that astringent edge to it, and you can use hotter water. This water is probably at 208. 
Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and for the rinse, I'm just gonna go in a circle and get everything nice and wet because this is a cake, this is a pressed tea, and it takes longer to get going. It takes more heat to get going, and it also takes more time to get going. So this tea, I'm gonna rinse it and let it sit for just a second when I rinse it longer than I usually do. Being pressed like that means that it has less surface area, more volume, and so the tea on the interior of the cake is not going to get hit with the water as much as the tea on the outside of the cake. And so I'm gonna go ahead and let it sit. That's long enough. I'm gonna go ahead and pour it out. And instantly we can see the difference in color. This is just the rinse. This is kind of this peachy, lovely peachy, nice color. And oh boy, oh yeah, I am very excited to drink this one. Ah, oh man, I'm gonna leave the lid on for this one. I don't let my, um, maybe I'll tilt it a tiny little bit, just a little bit aperture there. Because uh, the older the tea gets, basically the older that pour gets, the higher the heat you're gonna use, the longer steeping you're gonna get, the less astringency and bitterness it's gonna have, the darker the liquor is gonna become. Ultimately, eventually you're gonna have that black, brown, red liquor that we associate with shu or shou pour. We do get that darkness eventually from sheng pour. It just takes a really long time. This is a dry aged sheng, which means it was not aged in Hong Kong or Guangzhou or Guangxi or one of those humid places. This tea has been in Yunnan on the mountain. It was created on this entire time for the past 10 years. So it ages slower, but it has a more uh, complex flavor than what we call wet aged pu'er, which is pu'ers that come from Hong Kong or, or uh, Guangzhou, or these really humid parts of Southern China. There's the liquor, nice, beautiful, gold colored, reddish gold liquor. Yeah, and I'm gonna go ahead and for steeping. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, run us through two more steepings so that y'all can see kind of the progression of the way that this cake looks. And again, the Tasa Bing is not pure Gushu Cha. And so, again, I'm gonna go ahead and do my, my pouring down the side little trick there. Less crucial, I'm gonna go ahead and give a little circle at the end. Less crucial. And as we do this, remember, as we talked about in our introductory episode, be adaptive with your tea pouring. You know, even with that Duoyi, I cooled it at first, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna steep it at that same cool temperature for all 10 or 11 steepings that we're gonna get out of the tea. Likewise, go with your gut, feel what's right, and, and feel it out, smell the tea, taste the tea, and respond to what the tea is, is doing. So if you feel like you need to raise the temperature and you want a, a more robust brew, raise the temperature. If you feel like you want to go in a circle, if you feel like you want to break that cha don open and get a little burst of, of juice out of the tea, then go ahead and do it. It's your tea, it's your experience. Do it your way. We're just here providing some guidelines. So there, even deeper, beautiful, lovely color. This is the first steeping that we're gonna drink. I'll go ahead and pour some for the boys, our uh, noble film crew here making it happen. And then we'll do one more drinkable steeping. This is for Papa Bear, all right. And then one more steeping so you can see kind of the progression of how the color changes as this being unfurls. And so again, be responsive. Those first two steepings, pretty long. Longer than you'd think, maybe, if it was a loose tea, but this isn't a loose tea, it's a pressed tea. And look at what it's doing. It's getting all fluffy, it's fluffing up. Remember how, how, uh, how little those chunks were at the beginning and now they're all fluffing out? Well, what does that mean? It means that now the water's able to get in there between all those leaves now that they're all loosened up. And so now we have a lot of surface area. All of a sudden we've got a big bunch of tea that is steeping very quickly. So now it becomes important to use that uh, handle pour technique to reduce the astringency. And now we're gonna do a fast steeping. Um, so that's what it means to be responsive with. Pressed tea especially is a very different animal than loose tea and it requires you to be very attentive, especially when you get to the second, third, fourth steepings, it gets really fast. Faster even than if the tea were loose to begin with. I love this guy one. Yes. All right. Beautiful. How about that? And we can just compare the color of the liquor. Same mountain, same farmer, different ages. 
of T. This one is last year's. This is 10 years old. Boom, how about that? That's the progression of the color of T. So there we can see the difference between this 10 year aged T and this much younger one year aged. So just to continue with our trajectory, we're gonna go ahead and dump this out. Don't worry, I will be drinking all of this tea later. No tea is gonna be wasted in the filming of the show. Give this a little rinse here, get it going. And so to continue with our progression, we're going to be uh, steeping an even older tea. We're going to, we started with last year's, then we did a 10 year, and now we're going to do a uh, 18 year old tea, Ling Ling, which means zero zero. And actually this tea is not strictly 18 years old. It's um, from leaves from the year 2000, 2001, and 2002, and 2003, so four years together. And it's what is called the tail of a batch of tea. So you get down to the last couple pounds of tea. It's not enough to sell to one customer in a big batch. And so you keep it and you uh, just mix it with next year's tea, or at least back in the year 2000. This is what Li Xu Lin, who makes all the teas that we've made today. He's my Puar farmer. Li Xu Lin uh, started his own operation, his solo operation in the year 2000. Before then, he worked for the Dai Yi factory, previously known as the Meng Hai factory. These are the folks who invented the process of fermenting Puar. So he worked there for about 30 years, retired to do his own thing in the year 2000, and part of his first batch, the end of his first batch, got combined with the next, the tale of next three years, batches, and that's Ling Ling. It is a big batch of tea, all from the very beginning of the 2000s, from 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2003. So a nice aged tea, and you can see the color of the leaves. The leaves themselves are much darker. And this was produced at a time when the, the, they weren't making Gu Shu Cha, or Li Shu Lin wasn't making Gu Shu Cha on Nanwa Mountain. So this tea will contain Gu Shu material. It's not 100% Gu Shu Cha but it does contain material from old trees. And I, oh, hold on, need my Gong Dao Bay. Don't want to forget that. Won't have nowhere to pour the tea into. Okay, so I'm gonna go full heat with this because this tea is old enough to vote. Well, some of it is anyway, uh, in this country. So I'm gonna go ahead and go full heat. I'm gonna go ahead and give the leaves a little spin around right there. There we go. Be a little more aggressive with my pour. And this loose tea, this was stored loose this whole time, was never pressed, so I'm gonna go ahead and pour it right away. And instantly we have this beautiful gold red color. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that's our rinse. And so from that warm rinse, it opens it up, it gives us our fragrance of our tea, and so now we're getting into that very earthy territory. Now we're getting into that loamy, silty kind of quality that we get um, from when we think of shu puar or when we think of very old sheng puar. Some of those notes are beginning to appear, but in contrast to shu or shou puar, which comes off of the line fermented, this has the earthiness, but it also has a lot of complexity to it. A lot of the floral notes of the fresh sheng puar of that duo yi tea have remained, and that's the big difference between old sheng and old shu puar. As sheng ages, sheng will never become shu or shou puar. Sheng puar will remain sheng puar for its entire life, but as it ages, it becomes what's called mature sheng chen cha. Chen means mature. And any tea that's aged can be called chan cha. You can have chan bai cha, or an aged white tea, or you can have chan oolong cha, uh, aged oolong. And, and shu puar also will become chan cha if it's old enough. But chan puar, chan sheng puar, is going to start to resemble in a very superficial way shu puar in that it will get dark and earthy, but it will re retain some of the complexity and fragrance of a fresh sheng puar, which makes it a little bit of a nicer thing. For me, I prefer Old Sheng to uh, Shu Puar. And so I'm gonna be a little more aggressive hitting the center of the leaf mass a little bit and going in a little bit of a circle there. Because this tea is so old, we don't have to worry about it being bitter and astringent. Most of that bitterness and astringency is gone. I'm also gonna give it a little longer steep, not because it needs it, but because I like it that way. Um, this kind of old tea can be steeped much warmer and not much longer because we're not worried about making it bitter anymore. There we go. 
Beautiful. And that beautiful red wicker there. I'll go ahead and save this for later. <laughs> I'm gonna drink a lot of tea in a minute. And then I'll go ahead and give us one more nice little steeping. I'm gonna let this one go a little longer and give you all an idea of how the leaves are gonna look or how the wicker is gonna look after a couple of steepings. And general rule, the older the tea, the more steepings you can get out of it. Uh, good fresh sheng puer, I'll say seven to 10 steepings. Really old uh, puer like this, really old sheng puer like this. I'll steep it like maybe 20, 30 times. And you know, it's getting a little soft by the end, but it's still pretty juicy and good. And it's spent so much time getting to where it has, I wanna really squeeze it out and appreciate it. So go ahead and give this a little bit longer steep. And again, because this puar is aged, I'm not bothering to take the lid off in between. At this point, I'm not even skewing the lid. I'm just gonna let this tea sit in there and be nice and hot and stay hot uh, while, while I make, uh, in between steepings. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pour this out. And I'm actually gonna tighten my aperture a little bit here and give it a little bit of a slower pour. There we go. All righty, so there's our 2000, there's our Tassa. This has got eight to five years on this one. Very similar color because they're both in that kind of golden pour stage. Give it a couple more years and this liquor will start to achieve that dark black soy saucy color that you see from Shu Puar, but it does take a while. And that is our Sheng Puar episode. This is my favorite kind of tea. I hope that you also will learn to enjoy Sheng Puar. It does have very strong qi. It has the very pure taste of tea. For me, Sheng Puar, uh, I love it because whereas an oolong or a, or a hong cha or a green tea might have grassy notes or cacao notes or might taste like uh, tobacco or something like that. Um, uh, all kinds of different characters and flavors we get from the, the diversity of cultivated and highly developed teas. Sheng Puar, for me, is the pure and unadulterated taste of tea and the progression as it ages. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been Gong Fu Tea Cha. I'm Sohan, this is Guan Yin Tea House, and please join us next time for another exciting episode about Chinese tea and tea culture. All right, have a good one.